The following interview was conducted with Professor uh, Charles Ernsman for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on uh, Monday, May the 5th, 2008, at his office in Zucker Labs. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. This is part two of a, of a previous interview. Go ahead, sir. I'll let you get started. He's going to share some of his reminiscences of the university and students and the curriculum. Uh-huh. What I, uh, one of the things I felt uh, was a major change was the uh, uh, personal association, uh, particularly between the uh, professors and the students. And of course, there's a lot of interchange in the students that have disappeared as well. But uh, back in the early days, I can remember going from uh, class to class across the campus. Uh, quite frequently, I would see President Hovde sitting on a bench with two or three students just chatting, and uh, uh, I think Hakamo was his vice president at the time, and he would do the same. And it wasn't just once a week, I'd see him more than that. And uh, that was a, gave you the feeling that uh, they weren't all that remote, that uh, you could uh, have contact. And I was just talking to one of the professors before this uh, interview, and he was pointing out uh, exactly that, that uh, the uh, uh, ability, the accessibility of the professors uh, was much greater back in the earlier days than it is today. And this might be partly due to the uh, electronics involved. And I think in the earlier interview I mentioned uh, I was taking uh, the uh, rocket propulsion, well, air breathing and rocket propulsion course from uh, Professor Zucro, and I got stuck on uh, some problems, and he said, well, come on up to my house. And that's when he lived over on uh, 9th Street Hill, and uh, so I went over to his house for help. Now, how many times do you do that today? It's not too frequently. And so I, uh, I think that the uh, atmosphere was, uh, uh, it was a large school still, but they still managed to keep the small school atmosphere, is what mm -hmm. I would say, I guess. And I think that's uh, one of the things that we've lost today, and, and part of that may be due to the electronic communication that we have now. And I think in our, if we look at the society in general, uh, we find that uh, uh, people uh, communicate email rather than personal, so you're losing uh, personal contact and all of the things that can generate from that, uh, or you can uh, have a relationship that uh, enhances both of your lives, where uh, email really is a very unemotional thing. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, I think that's a, one of the things, and then of course in the case of the university, what we're seeing now is uh, they moved from, uh, I was checking with one of the other professors that uh, I remember was around here many, many years, and uh, Professor Hoffman, and uh, he was pointing out that, uh, uh, I've got to look at my numbers here, uh, that the uh, IBM uh, uh, 7094 was the first computer that was put in here at the university, and it was uh, housed in the math building, which is on University Street, across from the armory. I don't know if you remember that. And uh, was then big, big, big cabinets. Yeah, huge, a whole room full of cabinets, and then the. Uh, input uh, for the early computers was punch cards. So they had to uh, punch. Uh, I can remember Joe Hoffman taking over uh, to the same building because at the, at the early going, that was the only place you could input. We didn't have any satellite terminals like they did later. And uh, so he would take these drawers in his car and go over <laughs> to input his data to process his problem. And then he'd have to wait there to get the uh, output. And uh, then later they established satellite uh, terminals where you could input your cards 
at the satellites, and uh, but you still had to pick up the uh, response over at Mass. At the mainframe. Uh, yes, yeah, that's off the mainframe, right. And then they moved on into an IBM and a cyber and uh, got a little uh, more capability, but there was still uh, a lot of uh, uh, punch cards involved. And, and in fact, uh, Professor Hoffman did most of his research, calculated uh, responses uh, on the punch cards during his uh, getting his doctorate degree. So uh, I think this is one thing now, if you look at our present circumstance, uh, now you can uh, contact your uh, mainframe from your laptop. And uh, so you can do everything almost anywhere. And, uh, and you, can, you can run some real complex problems because all you have to do is call up the right program from the right. From the home base computer and uh, just provide the input to it and uh, go and, from there and go from there yeah and right. so it, it's uh, that has been a major change another uh, facet that uh, uh, has enhanced it or come about because of com uh, electronic equipment is the uh, uh, class notes I can remember when I was a student that uh, if I missed class, I had to get a hold of a buddy that took notes and uh, and get his copy and hope that he had taken a fairly good set. What do you do today? Well, many of the courses, you can call up the class notes from the computer and they're input by the professor. In fact, the lecture is often done that way. The only thing you miss there is the question and answer. Uh, Periods, you don't get that information, and uh, so now we've we've reduced personal relationships even farther by uh, going that route. Because I know my grandson took uh, uh, an education course here and got his teaching license in history. Teaches in one of the schools down there in Indianapolis, and he used to uh, uh, call up the uh, lecture notes. Uh, off the computer. Uh, he uh, did that, in fact, out of my house. So I uh, surprised at that, you know. And uh, so, uh, of course, we have a step in between, which is published notes, which uh, several professors put out. But uh, uh, in the case of engineering, where uh, if you were in an area that was making a lot of progress, uh, quite often, uh, the uh, 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 material would change very rapidly, so that the professor was having to keep altering his uh, sure. his notes, so uh, right. to upgrade. Yeah. And uh, so I think uh, the introduction of the electronic age, if we want to call it that, has reduced personal relationships, which we discussed earlier, right. and then it's also uh, uh, made the personal contact uh, in classroom that'd be with other students as well because uh, they're busy working with their uh, laptops. Right. So. How has registration changed over time? The registration process changed since you've been here. Well, uh, since you were talking about the computer, didn't it used to be maybe in the armory years ago? Or oh, like yeah. <coughs> I want to share a comment uh, on that. In fact, I can remember when I was a student, that's uh, what they did. It was at the armory, <coughs> pardon me, and you uh, 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 had to register in writing. <laughs> and, uh, Didn't they that, have a board up there or some yeah, sort of a screen then, to see what the, was available? The, uh, yeah, the uh, board was listing the available courses and so you could sign up and it was an interesting affair. It was done alphabetically. There's so many letters each day, because I remember they didn't do, uh, like, they didn't take mechanical engineering and just devote a day to it. Oftentimes it was more than one day sure. to get there, mostly alphabetical. Right. 
Right. But, uh, yeah, that that was. I had forgotten about that. I'm glad you reminded me right, of it. Yeah. What about the counseling of the students? That's changed over the time. What? Counseling of students. The one I because with part with registration changing, that impacts on the counseling yeah. and the guidance that you give them. Well, uh, <coughs> I can only speak for ME. Sure, that's fine. <coughs> Pardon me. And uh, but we have a counselor, and his uh, responsibility. He has a a uh, oh. Uh, I don't want to call her a secretary, but it, it's an assistant. And uh, so if a student has a uh, scheduling problem or wants to know what courses to take if he wants to specialize in a certain area, he can go and find the counseling is available. And uh, so ME has that. I'm not sure about all the other schools. Mm -hmm. Well, quite a few I'm schools. I'm pretty sure Double E does sure, as well. Right. Uh, and of course, in the first year, you go to freshman for engineering education, and then you, there's people there if you're looking to get some guidance on what school you might be interested in. Yeah. So they do start at that first level. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah, the campus-wide counseling consulting right. uh, sure. uh, consultation takes place uh, right. uh, at uh, other locations. But right. I know this, our school does. I know Double E does because I know one of the professors right. that did it. Right. At Double E, and, right. uh, so uh, that helps the student, uh, gives him guidance, right? And, Which uh, they often need. Yeah. 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 What about the curriculum? Were you involved in? There were changes to keep up with what's. Yes, uh, the uh, area. <coughs> pardon me. The area that I worked in was uh, uh, we looked uh, at an analysis of. Uh, it was mainly the main thrust was the response of mechanical systems uh, dynamically. So if you provided a, a real sharp input, how was, how did the system respond? So uh, we called this uh, statics and dynamics, which is the the course uh, title, and in it uh, they looked at the response of mechanical systems. Now these were uh, that particular course was one of the initial course and it looked at uh, physical systems, masses. You could characterize about any system as a mass and a spring and a damper. Where damper could be friction or or actually a physical damper like you would have in your automobile. Sure. And, uh, and then uh, uh, you modeled the systems and then you could predict their response to certain inputs. And uh, then that was extended then to look at uh, instrumentation where you're trying to measure a varying pressure. How does the system respond? Well, you can analyze it dynamically, applying your dynamics. And uh, so we had uh, an instrumentation course which was strongly uh, flavored toward dynamic response. And now, uh, most of these systems are characterized mathematically, so if you can characterize your input mathematically, you can predict the system response from it. Okay. Back in those days, you couldn't. You, you had to uh, run some tests to get results, and then from that you could predict what uh, the damping was in the system, what the uh, failure to respond properly was caused by. Sure. And that reflects the changes, as I said yeah. earlier, how the curriculum reflects the change in focus and mm -hmm. research and what the market, what people are, are studying. Yeah. In the uh, propulsion area, uh, the main early thrust in uh, propulsion was in uh, air breathing uh, because the individual that taught the course was uh, strong in that area and there were uh, people that could assist him. And then, of course, there was the fact that Allison Engine was down in Indianapolis, which uh, was very supportive of uh, Purdue when it was Allison. And in fact, Rolls Royce does a pretty good job now. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was uh, kind of a strong flavor in propulsion early, with a sort of a minor shot at rockets. And then uh, eventually, as rockets progressed, and uh, this is probably motivated uh, with the initiation of the 
of the moon shot, uh, well, satellite, launching satellites probably is really what initiated it. Sure. Then rockets uh, uh, became independent, and there was a series of courses you could take in rockets only, and then another series in air breathing engines only. And they expanded the air breathing to include uh, ramjets and, of course, today supersonic ramjets, uh, such as are used in some of the airplanes today. Mm -hmm. And uh, the rockets, of course, uh, the big boom was uh, in the moonshot Apollo. Sure. And uh, my understanding now, I just heard on the news that uh, we've contracted with Russia for so many flights to the space station because they're going to retire the shuttle. That's what uh, I hear. So uh, we, we keep talking about sending our labor outside the country. Well, there's, there's certainly a case. Right. And now they've had, what, two rough landings. So yeah. there's uh, concern now about uh, whether that's the uh, right way to go. Right. Yeah. But uh, apparently the uh, present administration doesn't want to invest the money in another vehicle. Uh, the one that they, uh, the NASA's working on is uh, one that won't be ready for a number of years yet. Right. Well, after they retire the shuttle, so there's right. a gap in there. Okay. So what they're doing is going with the Russians until then. But okay. In any event, uh, uh, the world is catching up. We're moving forward. Yeah, moving forward. Right. <laughs> moving some <laughs> of it out. There. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Well, people complain about uh, sending jobs outside the United States, and that's certainly one. Yeah. And, uh, and the fact that they've had a couple bad landings now, uh, no one was killed, but they. Uh, Does shake you up a little close bit. Close to it, yeah. Right, yeah. 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 Um, what about any university committees? Did you serve on any? Uh, were you on the Senate at all? Or well, uh, let's see. I'm trying to think. Uh, well, uh, uh, oh boy, I was on the. What did they call that committee? It's the. Uh, I think it was the Education Committee, would that sound right? Could be. Could be something it, in the it, Senate. Whenever uh, uh, a school was, uh, engineering Back. school, now this is all engineering, okay. uh, was uh, thinking of initiating a change in their curriculum, they had to g go through this committee to get it approved, right. and then we would recommend to the administration that it be approved. Okay. And uh, so uh, uh, we were a key part of that. Sure. And I served on that, uh, boy, I can't remember what year it was, but it was... Sometime, a little while. Sometime, yeah. yeah a little right. while back. That's yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah. Tell us about the uh, academic rank, how the change, the promotion thing has changed over time. The, the uh, change? Change, it's uh -huh. changed a little bit, hasn't it? Uh -huh. Well, uh, <clears throat> I think that uh, as far as uh, promotions are concerned, I think uh, the... Uh, uh, the uh, uh, oh, uh, criteria, I think, is still uh, pretty much the same. Mm -hmm. There has to be a definitely demonstrated performance, right. uh, and uh, it has to be demonstrated over a period of time. Right. And then, uh, if there's a promotion within that particular area, then it's granted. If you're looking for, say, a promotion over all of the schools of engineering, then that's a little uh, tougher to come by because uh, you may be taking a mechanical engineer and putting him in over AA and uh, so forth, uh, sure. civil. And, uh, right. Uh, but however, uh, let's see, I was on the military programs committee. I forgot that. Yeah. Good. Okay. And uh, what we did, our responsibility there was uh, uh, we had to interview and pass the incoming commanders for the ROTC program. So uh, uh, whenever they were going to change commanders, uh, now this is the military guy, not, okay. the, not the ROTC. Right, understand. Uh, we would have to interview them and then uh, make a recommendation to the university, and then they would uh, 
approve a certain person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I forgot that. Okay. Were they here for a certain and period of time? I had an opportunity there, which was a lot of fun, but we went up to Grissom, and uh, at the time Grissom was one of the major uh, bases for uh, refueling airplanes, mm -hmm. and, uh, and we flew on a uh, refueling mission from Grissom out over to Nebraska, refueled an airplane, and uh, we got to lay down next to the boom operator and see him hook up. So there was one, two, three, four, four of us. So it wasn't a crowd. And then uh, since I had had some experience with dead reckoning uh, navigation, uh, uh, I was chatting with the navigator, and he says, well, why don't you sit down here and navigate us back to Grissom? I said, okay. Well, I missed it by seven miles. <laughs> and that wasn't too bad. <laughs> You're in the ballpark. <laughs> yeah, but that was one of the fun things on that committee, uh, is that they took us all up there and sure. uh, gave us a ride yeah. uh, on their uh, refueling plane. Right. What were your, your special research inter uh, areas that you concentrated on? My, my research? Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, for as a professor? Right. Primarily rocket work. Okay. The uh, uh, we have a, a facility that we uh, built here in the 1960s uh, to run rocket engines at high pressure, and uh, Dr. Zucro uh, had gotten a grant from uh, NASA for seven hundred fifty thousand dollars, and then another one from. Uh, Washington, oh boy, what was that from? Uh, but the total came out to about 1.2 million. And, uh, and uh, I think in my earlier mm -hmm. interview, right. I indicated I, came, I was asked to come back sure. and help with that. Right, and, and then you continued uh, on in this area. So then I, I also started doing my research there. And what we were looking at was running uh, rocket engines up to uh, very high chamber pressures, and we uh, at that facility made it up to 4,000, which was about 4,500 pounds per square inch pressure, chamber pressure. At the time uh, we were doing that work, uh, the most commonly used pressure was about 350 pounds per square inch pressure. And uh, I think I pointed that out maybe in the previous interview, I'm not sure, but one of the NASA officials was here and uh, told Zucro and me uh, we were wasting our time working at this high pressure that was not useful. And uh, now we had already predicted that uh, at sea level a high pressure would in fact uh, enhance performance. As it turned out that same NASA official wound up in charge of the main engines on the shuttle which ran at 6,000 PSI pressure. <laughs> so well, I thought he didn't like high pressure. <laughs> but of course, the, the pressure is, is a significant advantage at the lower altitudes. And in space, it doesn't really make that much difference. Okay. How, how much you expand it to. Sure. And uh, so uh, I, what we did there was worked on uh, self-igniting propellants. Uh, nitrogen tetroxide and uh, uh, mixed halogen fuel. And all you had to do is bring them together in a light. And then we ran that up to high chamber pressure. And uh, it took a, uh, oh, uh, I'd say probably a good year and a half to uh, get the pressure up high enough. Now we built a system, of course, to tolerate it. But sure. And there was one, uh, one thing we uh, uh, had to be concerned with with the system was if the stand blew up, uh, we wanted to be able to shut those propellants off awful quick. Otherwise, you had a big fire. <laughs> so uh, we had to replace some of the valves with fast-acting valves that could uh, close in one to two milliseconds. And, uh, so that was another search through uh, industry to try to find a company that could build one. Sure. 
and we finally did and got uh, got the program off. Good. And uh, then we did uh, heat transfer. The uh, uh, alloy, oh, excuse me. Yeah. The uh, alloy that was used in the shuttle main engines was a copper zirconia alloy, and uh, the zirconia gives copper strength, and copper gives you good conductivity, so you can transfer heat because rocket engines run at very high temperatures, and. Uh, so they wanted to use copper, but they added zirconia for give it physical strength. Well, the zirconia would uh, come out of uh, solution and form crystals, and then once it formed crystals, then cracks in the copper would propagate from the crystals, and the chamber would fail. And Rocketdyne had encountered that, and uh, they were searching uh, for an exact. Uh, a method of introducing the zirconia where it would not come out of solution and form crystals. So we ran samples of this alloy uh, in our high pressure rocket engine because the heat transfer rate was almost the same as we would have gotten in the main engine on the shuttle. So we could expose it to the same environment and then we would cycle it and then they would take the sample back and analyze it to see uh, if the uh, zirconia came out or not. And uh, that problem was finally solved and incorporated on the main engines for the shuttle by rocket dive. Very good. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Um, any other, some thoughts? And uh, don't talk about um, change, one thing preservation archives. Uh, there's movement what do you is your thoughts on that saving the things well i my my feeling is uh, uh of course being being history <laughs> i guess is uh, that we should do that uh because uh i guess one of the things i i see is that we have a lot of experience i i, I see this in the rocket area because that's what i'm specialized in sure that we've had a lot of experience in that area, and if there was access to the history of what went on when under certain conditions, we could avoid errors that we're gonna make again because uh, it's not available. If you, can, if you know it existed, then you could probably find it, but a lot of the students and professors don't know that. And as a result, uh, uh, there isn't a nice place to go search for that subject. So I think uh, that an archival library is extremely important uh, for technical progress, not only from the just the, just the, the uh, preservation of history, but also the advancement of technology. Because I see, I see things happen in the rocket industry that are repeats of previous experiments or, or work that's been done, development work. And as a result, uh, uh, time's wasted. If they had just gone into literature, they could have, uh, if they had an archival right. response. Good. So I'm uh, very much in favor of it. And uh, right now, as I think I mentioned before, I've uh, received a whole lot of material on a particularly unique rocket engine called the plug nozzle, which I would like to put in Purdue's archival library and make it accessible to uh, the nation. Because it's still not an idea that should be tossed out. It may still be used. In fact, on the uh, uh, X-33, they were going to use a plug nozzle. And then, of course, they canceled the program, so it didn't happen. But uh, uh, those people could have acquired a lot of information from a couple of individuals that I know that could put a leg up on development tests for plug nozzles. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm in much in favor of of uh, uh, what I wanted to do is, is put this literature, which uh, the individual worked on it, is 
willing to give to Purdue's library if they uh, will archive it. Mm -hmm. If it's just going to be stacked up in a box somewhere with no records, uh, he doesn't want to do that. Sure. But mm -hmm. if it's going to be made available, if somebody at uh, Cornell can go to their library and look and see what Purdue's got on that subject, and they can find it because you've indexed it, then I think it's very useful. Yeah. Especially on yeah, I'm right. in, very much in favor of that. Yeah. Any, uh, go Thank ahead, you. You, some other reminiscences that you wanted to share with the, for the researchers? What's that? Any other reminiscences, some more research, uh, reminiscences that you'd like to share? Well, uh, what I've uh, been doing is uh, uh, some of the students uh, Good. haven't had a lot of experience in experimental work, and I think one of the important parts of uh, uh, any research program is, okay, you can sit down and theorize, you can do a whole bunch of calculations and predict, but until you prove it experimentally, uh, it doesn't carry a lot of weight. And so uh, what happens in our cycle here is quite often a student will do uh, all of the paper research and uh, whatever calculations are required using the techniques we've mentioned earlier, uh, facilities. Uh, and then uh, once he gets his uh, predictions and they look promising, then he has to go to an actual experiment to prove that in fact does, the system does behave that way. And so when that, that comes about, then quite often I'll uh, some of the professors will send their students in and I'll help them with the system to get, because uh, I've done a lot of it and, uh, and I stay fairly current, so. That's very good. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Do you work with the graduate students or undergrad that's, that's, students? That's grad students. Grad students. Yeah, we have no undergrad students here. Okay. Uh, uh, I, uh, uh, I think that uh, it's a matter of uh, the staff's personal choice. Uh, I don't think it's necessarily a good one. Uh, I think uh, if we had undergrads that were here as technical assistants or something like that, that we might be able to stimulate some of them into doing graduate work in the uh, particular same area. Sure. But uh, we don't, uh, professors just don't do it. Mm -hmm. And. What we've done here is most of the students, grad students, do their mechanical work, uh, installation work, but fabrication work is done by a shop. And then they have to come up with a design to give to the shop to build. And then they have to install it and uh, check it out. And then they also have to design their control system so it controls the experiment the way it should. And with rockets particularly, you've got to be sure that uh, all of the events are occurring uh, properly. And I think probably one of the things that comes to mind is uh, in the early going here at Purdue, and this is a result of an Air Force decision, that they wanted to go to white fuming nitric acid as a rocket oxidizer and uh, jet fuel as a, as a fuel. Well, if you mix as little as a teacup of that together and then heat it up, it'll detonate like a, like a stick of TNT. And it'll blow a hole in your chamber wall or whatever. And uh, so now we gotta worry about accumulating that amount of propellant in a rocket before it fires. We don't want that to happen, do we? So uh, we have to design a control system then to keep that quantity to keep it in below the critical limit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so those are the kind of problems that we have to deal with uh, working with the uh, sure. rocket system. Right. So you keep pretty active in your retirement, don't you? You're in? Well, I, I do, yes. And I, I probably uh, another action, activity I have is doing uh, papers on uh, subjects that have not, uh, in a rocket area, that have not been particularly explored. And uh, one I, I can mention real quick is uh, 
uh, General Electric did a lot of work on rockets at uh, Malta up near Syracuse, New York. You look at the published information, there's very little available. So I thought, well, gee, that's a good subject. So I got a hold of a lot of the people that used to work there and uh, generated a paper and gave it at the uh, AIAA Joint Propulsion Conference. Very good. So uh, that's it. the kind of thing I, I do and uh, in, uh, uh, devote some of my time to. And then I've been active in the AIAA I was uh, deputy director for education for Region 3, which is uh, Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, Kentucky, Illinois, and Wisconsin. And in that position, uh, I had to organize the student conference each year, which we tried to have different universities host. By the way, Purdue had hosted it the one, two, three years ago. And uh, the last one was uh, University of Western, Western Michigan. Before that was University of Notre Dame. And before that was Ohio State. So we skip around. And, uh, Stay within the region, though. That's yeah, nice. Yeah, it's all in the region. Good, yeah. good. And then the, pay, the students present papers there. And this gives them some experience because uh, the committee that we have, or the judges, I should say, that we have uh, judging the quality of the papers and the presentation are people out of industry who have been down the road. And so it gives the student good experience in that he's presenting his paper not to a OG whiz audience, but an audience that will be critical. That can really and critique so it's it. A, it's a building thing for the student. That's why we have it. Yeah. Right. That's very good. And, uh, so I've just, just bowed out of that. Now we've uh, got a new regional director, and uh, so he's appointed a guy from, uh, let's see, University of Illinois, Chicago. And, uh, so but you'll we'll be a resource. We'll see how that works out, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm trying to give him all of the experience that I've had sure. and uh, hopefully help him out. Resources are very helpful and very needed. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Any other comments that uh, you think you think you covered pretty much what uh, you wanted to share with the researchers? What's that? You think you pretty much covered what the you wanted to share with the researchers? I mean, work. Well, that, the that's what I do. Right now, there's that's a good. lot of other work going on. Oh, sure. That's sponsored by other professors. Sure. I think probably one of the uh, ones that's uh, of a lot of interest now nationally is the uh, pulse detonation propulsion system. Uh, this is a, uh, a system that uh, uh, they put, put a, uh, a fuel-air mixture in a tube and then they light one end of it and then the pressure wave that's generated by the combustion accelerates up to acoustic velocity and uh, so it's detonation velocity. And so it, when it comes out of the end of the pipe, it sounds like an explosion, like a gun, because that's a detonation. A, 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 a rifle would be a, a, a detonation source. And, uh, and except that now we want that detonation to occur at real high frequency. So they had a program here at the lab in which they got up, I know they've gotten up to 32 detonations per second. And that gets into the region of propulsion. Well, why use it? Well, you can more efficient, you can burn your fuel and air mixture more efficiently in that you can gain some uh, uh, 15 to 20 percent uh, propulsion out of your same pound of fuel air mixture that you could over just running it through a, a jet engine. Sure. And uh, so uh, pulse detonation technology is, has been researched uh, and is of national interest now. And, uh, oh, good. And, uh, so they're that doing sounds most that encouraging. Well, yeah. yeah, very good. Yeah. Okay. Any uh, closing comments that you'd like to share with us? Well, I, I think I've, uh, the, the, the point that I, I would like to see 
is uh, 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 have the circumstances at the university set up such that uh, more personal contact can be uh, stimulated, I should say, and make it an asset. If, if we talked about promotion and the criteria for promotion, uh, maybe part of that could be your contact with the students. And uh, uh, of course the students' input does help in the evaluation of the professor, but I mean, it, uh, it, uh, it, to me, a good bit of the, much, uh, there's considerable amount of education occurs in casual conversations on maybe the, the subject of the course with the professor, but uh, not necessarily focused on your problem, maybe just discussing some of the general information that the professor had, which will enhance the student's uh, background. And, uh, so I, I would guess my feeling would be that there's some way we could stimulate uh, that interaction, enhance it again, in our present environment, which is really stifling it, in my opinion. All right. Okay. Thank you very okay. much, President okay. Erdogan. My pleasure. Thank you.